Hello, Media Theory class. This is the second video I'm recording today, and we're doing this one on the Tower of Babel, another unlikely assignment for a Media Theory class. But I think it's worthwhile, and, and we'll talk about why. So a little background on the Tower of Babel. It, obviously, this story is from uh, the Genesis, Book of Genesis in, in the Old Testament, and it's a narrative that actually goes back well before that. Uh, it dates back to 2242 BC, so it is certainly one of the oldest stories dealing with media in, in the form of communication uh, that we have. It's four, over 4,000 years old, and it is in what the Greeks would call an ideology, uh, ideology being the, the term for a story that is meant to explain something. It's an origin story. And, and we see this, one of the interesting things about this story is that we see it throughout a, a, a wide number of cultures appearing at all different times. So the Greeks, the Romans, Sumerians, Assyrians, Toltecs, etc., uh, all have their own version of, of this tale. So it's, it's interesting. It's, you know, it's, it's told all the way from India to uh, Africa to, to the Americas. So what, is it, what does it say? What's, what are the details? What's the, what's the narrative? So in the, in the story, uh, this is post-flood, uh, the, the united human race all speaks a, the same language, and they're together, uh, migrating eastward, where they come to the, the land of Shinar, uh, where they agree to build a city and tower. And this tower would have its top reaching all the way to the heavens. And Yahweh, the, the God of the Old Testament, sees this city and tower confuses their speech, makes them speak different languages so that they can't communicate to each other anymore, and then scatters them around the earth. A very straightforward kind of ideology. Why are we reading this? I would argue that, uh, much like the, the Plato allegory, that with the Tower of Babel story, we, we have a, a narrative that functions as a form of media criticism. Uh, again, some 4,000 years old, and, and is obviously an ancient form of, of media criticism. And, and ultimately, it's a, it's a form of critical theory. So how is it media criticism? Well, media is just the plural form of medium, which, in a, in a broad context, describes any channel of communication. And speech is, is a channel of communication. And I say it's critical theory because critical theory usually examines culture as well as its social, historical, and ideo ideological components. Uh, and, and these are, in a really uh, true sense, constitutive components. So they're, they're the parts that make up culture, social, historical, and ideological forces. So these things make up culture, and critical theorists then examine this culture, and, and primarily in critical theory, we're interested in, in what I would call flows of power. Who, who possesses power? How do they keep it? Uh, and, and how does this work on different levels in the society? So I think that's what we find here. Ultimately, the, the Tower of Babel parable is about the power of language. It's about t technology. On the face, it's, it's a story about hubris. Uh, mankind again, like, much like uh, much like the uh, Jurassic Park narrative or the the story about Frankenstein, where you know mankind figures out they can do something, but then doesn't stop to ask if they can do it, right? So so it's a it's a story that relates to those others about the danger of knowledge, and it's rooted in in community, in culture, and interestingly, of course, the roots of of community and and communication are the same. They, they both use the Latin root com, which means with or together. And, and I suggest to you that this speaks to the evolutionary imperative for people to communicate. So by evolutionary imperative, what I'm, <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is that humankind uh, must, in a sense, communicate with one another in order to survive. And if we think back to the caveman days, this is fairly easy to see. If you're a caveman, you're wandering through the woods and you come across a, a lion, you don't have much of a chance in a one-on-one -on -one fight. So then obviously we have to ask ourselves, how did the humankind become the, the alpha, alpha predators? How did we get to the top of the food chain? And the answer is through community and through communication. Uh, 
You get a bunch of people together sharing information and knowledge, and, and they can beat the lions. They can beat the tigers and the bears. Oh, my. We can, we can beat whatever we put our minds to, but only through this kind of communication and, and culture, community. So the Tower of Babel is critical theory to the extent, then, that it's critiquing language and technology. So, you know, the Bible tells us the story. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And the people say, come, let us make bricks and fire them thoroughly. Let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. So all the way to God. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So then power. Right? We, we just saw technology, now we're dealing with power. So the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the mortals had built, and the Lord said, look, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing they propose to do will now be impossible for them. So this is interesting to me, because we're dealing with the Old Testament God, which, is, of course, is very different than the New Testament God. The Old Testament God is an angry God. He's vengeful. This is, not a, this is not a kind, benevolent kind of God. This is a God who gets jealous and is threatened. And what threatens God here? It's that the one people are speaking one language, and it's this technology, it's, it's literally this communication, this ability to communicate with one another, that makes them dangerous. Because this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. So you see that this tale is a warning. It is a warning, in a sense, about the, the dangers of the power of knowledge, about hubris, and ultimately about communication and the power of communication, the power of narrative, the, the power of being able to, to share information, stories with one another. And so God being threatened says, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. So uh, again, I mean, from a critical theory perspective, if we're talking about power and how power is maintained, this is a... a this is a vengeful, totalitarian kind of God who's threatened by the technology and the power of communication and as a result simply renders the people unable to communicate with one another in order to maintain power. So, this should suggest to you the power of communication and the danger that this power holds for many people who find themselves in positions of authority and who would like to hang on to that authority. So, language is important because it affords us communication, which in turn affords us community. It's powerful because it allows us to think and in this sense, really, I mean, it allows us to recognize ourselves, right? If we go back to Descartes and cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, we think in words. And it's only through these words that we begin to, to recognize our own being. And in this sense, communication not only gives us community, but it also gives us Self. So if you study uh, social psychology, you'll learn there's a, there's a story uh, that perhaps you, you might have learned in another communication class. But there's a, a true story about the wild boy of Aveyron, who is a young man who was found in France a couple of decades back, who was raised himself, essentially, in the woods and had no interaction with other people. And of course, scientists wanted to study this, this kid, so they brought him in. And what they quickly realized is that he had no idea of self, of me, or I. Those words didn't mean anything to him. Because he was never around other people. 
to communicate with. As a result, psychologists have for, for many years now believed that we, we learn about ourselves by talking with others, by communicating with others. So this, this communication isn't just about banding together, it's about knowing who you are yourself. And then finally, language is also important because it influences how we think about reality. Now, it doesn't influence reality, right? it's, but it does change how we think about reality. For example, you know, you can't think about things, I mean, language, is, is, language has limitations, so you can't think about things that you don't have words for. We can think about things like a unicorn, because we know what a horn is, and we know what a horse is. But language limits our ability to, to think in a way. So it, so it in a way, it, it delimits our reality. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry, I have a cold. But language, the words that we use, enable us to think about reality in different ways. And, and this idea that, that the words that we use influence how we see the world and how we think of it, uh, this is called linguistic relativity. And it's, it's a theory that's existed in a, for a long time on the more scientific side of communication. Uh, and, and there were two theorists, Sapir and Worf, uh, who hypothesized, right, who famously came up with the Sapir-Worf hypothesis. And, and this is really the strongest kind of linguistic relativity. But they say that, that language, in a sense, defines reality. And this goes back to that idea that I, I shared with you just a moment ago, that words are empowering, uh, but they also limit us in a way. You know, the Eskimos have however many different words for snow. I'm sure you've heard this before. Uh, but what that does, and having all these different words for, for snow, allows them to talk about the reality of the snow around them and understand it differently than uh, someone like myself who, who's limited by the one word for snow. I mean, when you, when you think about it, if we want to get even a little bit more far out, and I realize I'm getting quite philosophical on you now, but one of the things that I've thought a lot about is love, the word love in, in the English language. Think about all the ways that you use it. I love pizza. I love my wife. I love my children. We're using the same word to describe all these very different things. I, I mean, my love of my kids is very different than my love of pizza. So you see how that, how that word, the use of one word for all those things, limits us. Now, the Germans, they have all different kinds of words for love, brotherly love and so on. Um, romantic love, brotherly love, affinity for, right? Uh, and this allows them to talk about the concept of love in a, in a more nuanced and complicated way. So again, I, I hope, you know, I'm sort of, sort of going on here, uh, and I'll wrap it up because I wanted these lectures to be short, but, but hopefully this helps you see the critical theory ultimately is, is about uh, the study of power, and critical media theory is about the, the study of power as it relates to communication. And this clearly is a very old and very interesting example of, of the critique of, of power, thinking about power and how it relates to our ability to communicate with one another. All right, that's it. Thanks for checking out this video.